No, I won't use it. Good morning. How you doing? Fantastic. Welcome back, guys, from being away. I've been watching all your Facebook posts and uh, amazing places that you visited. I'm just going, oh, one day I'd like to be there. Was it great? Fantastic. Uh, Terence and Nicole were uh, gallivanting around the world, which was fantastic. Welcome back to a little bit smoky Melbourne. So, uh, praise God. Isn't it amazing how the stories of the fires is reaching around the world? and uh, people <coughs> around the world are being moved by it. Isn't it amazing, however, how God uh, pu- is putting out the fires by causing this in- incredible and unseasonal summer rain uh, and a change in the weather uh, so that those fires can be put out? And uh, I've been seeing, I haven't seen how you know verified they are, but uh, I've been hearing stories of... Uh, amazing rescues out of Malakuta of where people had nothing but to pray to God and they didn't believe in God. They were completely atheists and uh, they prayed and uh, God redeemed them in a miraculous way. And so it's just extraordinary to see what's, uh, what God is doing in and through this. God is not the cause of these bushfires. It's not God's judgment. Uh, we as man have been given a mandate from the beginning of Genesis to uh, multiply and have dominion in, in the earth yeah. and that is to manage this earth and manage this world well and so I would suggest that uh, whilst fires are a part of Australia, <coughs> um, man carries great responsibility to see uh, the land managed, amen? Yeah. I'm not getting political, I'm just studying an <laughs> absolute <laughs> fact. All right, so um, I could get political, but I won't. But it's so fantastic. So um, let's just give God thanks, shall we? Come on. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, that you have taken care of us, Lord, that you are saving people, God. Thank you for those fires that are put out, Lord. Even now, Lord, even now, Lord, the fires that are still burning, Lord, just put them out in Jesus' name. Lord, we just thank you for the generosity in this nation. And Lord, we thank you for your hand upon the people, Lord, in Jesus' name. We all said amen amen and amen. Well, first up, I've got a little bit of a... I, 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 th- I think we're just so incredibly spoiled with opportunity in this church. Um, it's amazing that we are able to have Gary and Sarah Morgan, Craig Petty, Rosalind Owens as well. Um, you know, these people are, uh, are asked for and sought all around the world. And uh, all I had to do was ask, and they said, absolutely, Matt, when do you need us? And so it was just, it's an absolute fantastic opportunity for us uh, as uh, who we are and uh, the current size of who we are. We're not staying this size, but at the current size of who we are to have world-renowned speakers come and sow into our lives. Isn't that awesome for Identity Conference? So it's just great. So first things first this morning is that I've got a video for you just to have a look at because we're going to be talking about testimony and this is about I think about a five and a half minute video so uh, sit back relax take note and allow God to touch you let's have a look I was sitting down and all of a sudden my heart started pounding really hard so I tried to stand up to um, go to my room to lay down and my legs didn't work and that was the the first of six months trying to figure out what was wrong with me I was fainting between 15 and 45 times a day. Sort of every day seemed like something else that I loved sort of got taken from from me. And um, and I couldn't be the mom I wanted to be or the wife I wanted to be or the friend I wanted to be. August of 2016, I went to Stanford um, Medical Center and they uh, diagnosed me with a rare condition called Guillain-Barre syndrome, an autoimmune neurological disease where your own immune system eats away at your nervous system. The doctors, um, after I got diagnosed, said um, there is no cure now. It's just something that thankfully does go away on its own, but some people are never really the same. And so I was sort of slowly getting my life back. And then uh, January 2nd, 2017, all of a sudden I started feeling really weird. I got diagnosed um, with a relapse of Guillain-Barre syndrome, which only happens in about three to five percent of people who get the disease. 
nobody knows how long it will last. Nobody knows how long it will take you to walk again. And so then every part of my life that had started coming back um, was sort of felt like the rug got ripped out from under me. I just felt like somehow like a failure. How is this happening to me again? What did I, did I do something wrong? And I would feel like, is God really real? Is he really there? Is he, if he is real, is he good? April 21st, 2017, I just cried out to God and I said, God, I don't think I can do this anymore. I don't know how I'm going to make it out as a, as a living, loving, caring, kind person who loves you. And the next morning I woke up and we left to go on a date. My husband and I had coffee. We just talked about life, talked about how in the world we were gonna make it through this mess. And a girl came up to us and she said, um, hi, excuse me, I'm learning to hear the voice of God. And I believe that God wants me to pray for you. Um, would that be okay? And so I just, yes, please do. And my uh, right leg started convulsing uncontrollably. Um, it was just a little bit at first and then more and more, but I got up to try to walk and nothing had really changed. So we got in our truck to go drive to the park and um, my both legs, um, my right and left leg this time started involuntarily convulsing. And so I decided to get out and walk and I walked without any problem at all. My legs went exactly where I wanted them to go for the first time in a year and a half. And so I decided that I wanted to run. This is impossible, but it's happening. And um, my husband was holding the phone, he was recording me. He just dropped the phone in his lap and started weeping. Um, his mind couldn't really believe that God could be that good. I get to live a life that's completely free of all boundaries. And my, I get to share that with my daughter, who now has this memory for her entire life of me coming home and um, being leaving in a wheelchair and coming back home and being completely free and able to run and um, able to run with me. And um, she has that memory of what God did for her whole life. So it's pretty awesome. <laughs> Down wow. Started, started How amazing is that? Amen. I'd watch it again, but uh, we haven't got time for it this morning. <clears throat> I'm always moved by hearing stories and words of, of uh, how, what God is doing around the world. Um, and uh, I've got uh, a collection of Australian testimonies coming out of all parts of Australia as to what God is doing and how God is moving and, uh, and how he is healing people's lives. Today I want to talk to you about an intentional and very real shift that I am wanting to see take place within the life of Manningham Christian Centre. And because the life of Manning Manningham Christian Centre is not the four walls or the pillars or the lighting or the sound or anything like that, the life of the Manningham Christian Centre is you. And the intentional shift that I would like and I'm respectfully uh, asking from you is that when we hear testimonies of the things that God is doing and has done, that we release a real excited praise and a real excited shout in response to it, okay? And I'm going to be talking about why we should do that. But first, I just want to say this to you first. It's a little bit of a community announcement before we get into the Word today. Is that all right? 98% um, of this message is not yet right in my life, but I know that we can walk that together. Is that okay? We're going to walk this journey together. Is that cool? All right, so I may not have everything perfect in relation to this, but I'm working on it. Can you relate to that as well? 
Is that all right? All right, and uh, just one other thing which I think is important, no animals and important humans were harmed in the making of this message, okay? <laughs> all right, every now and then God shapes us and moulds us and it it's, gets a bit achy and he get, gets a, a few little pains as he moulds and he shapes us into place, but uh, essentially we're not going to be harmed, good? Yeah? yeah, because God is absolutely all loving and all knowing and all caring. So today I am asking you the question, what are you talking about? You can turn to the person beside, beside you and say, what are you talking about? <laughs> what we're talking about today is the giving of testimony and not just the giving of testimony because I grew up in church and, and I had this sort of feeling and I had, sort of had this thing, well, I, I haven't got a testimony where I was clapped out doing this or doing that and then an angel appeared and suddenly he announced that I was pregnant and I gave birth. You know, I haven't, I haven't got a testimony uh, like that. But what I do have a testimony of is God's enduring faithfulness through my life of where I could have gone one way, but he kept me on the other amen I, I i feel you catching it i don't need to preach today well, because yeah, yeah. <laughs> <coughs> so it's the giving of our testimony each and every single person in this room has a testimony has something to say about the goodness and the faithfulness of god and the reason why i know that is that he is more faithful than you and i are and because he's more faithful, there is, the, there is the giving of the testimony and then there is our response to it. Because my testimony is very real to me and as I share it with you, I pray, I'm not going to share my testimony with you today, but my testimony is very real to me, all right, but as I share it, I pray that it would be exactly the same and as real to you as it is to me. All right, And so when I see and I hear these testimonies of this lady here who was instantly changed by, uh, by the power of God in a cafe after somebody was moved enough to go and pray with her, that woman was changed and as I hear it, I am changed. Yeah. All right, because there's a witness in my spirit. So I pray that your spirit today would be awakened to the power of your testimony, but also your response to others. So where are we going to go today? So today's quick overview. You'll see that uh, here's a couple of happy snaps from last week. We had a great time. I got incredibly sunburnt, but that's okay. <laughs> Um, to, today we're going to be looking at, we're just going to be touching on a couple of these things, we're not going to be digging t too deep, but we're going to be looking at the fact that we are made in the image of God. We're going to be talking about the language of today. We're going to be talking about the power of language, and it's not just the power of words, but the very power of language. We're going to be talking about how that relates to God's Word, and I'm going to introduce a new word to you uh, today, or well, a new phrase called Lashon Harak. Can you say Lashon Hara? It's probably not the way it's pronounced, but I'm not Jewish or Hebrew, so it's just going to be as Australian as it's going to get. So how, we're going to talk about how to praise, and we're going to talk about the fact that the root word of testimony in its original uh, absolute basic foundation means do it again because a testimony is talking about an event that's happened. All right? And so every time you talk about it, it's as though it's happened again. Your brain actually doesn't know the difference. That's why people who have experienced war or trauma don't want to talk about those things because their brain feels as though it's happening again. So every single time we... I'm getting into the Word and I'm... Every single time we tell our story, our brain relives the miraculous power that God has brought it through, okay? So, do it again is what testimony means. And then we're going to be talking about this intentional shift and how do we celebrate. Are you ready? Praise God. Well, in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28, this is out of the message, God spoke, let us make human beings in our image, make them reflecting our nature. God created human beings, he created them godlike. Turn to the person beside you and say, you're created godlike. <laughs> reflecting God's nature, you can say, I know back you can say I know it's not very Australian but you can say yeah I know I've been created like God hey do you know that that's actually an issue in your life because you don't want to believe that you've been created in the image of God 
you are that good. <laughs> okay. So reflecting God's nature. He created them male and female. Don't argue with me. You can argue with God. Okay. Is that cool? Because you are created in the very image of God. Incredible. We could just pause on that for a few weeks, <laughs> right? Okay, so reflecting God's nature, he created them male and female, God bless them, prosper, reproduce, fill the earth, take charge, be responsible for the fish of the sea, for the birds of the air, for every living thingeth that moveth on the face of the earth. Have you ever noticed a person who is contentious is surrounded by a lot of contention? Have you noticed that? What about somebody who lies? Somebody who lies a lot. I'm sure it's nobody here in the room, but somebody who lies and makes things up in their imagination and then speaks them out. Their whole life is living one lie to another. And not only that, they have lots of people lying to them. Do I look fat in this, honey? No, you can hear it, can't you, right? No, I'm joking. I have a friend who carries such extraordinary faith that when even he has failed to do something that he should have, all us guys say, yep, absolutely, that happens to me regularly, um, God makes what he should have done happen. And so uh, just a quick testimony of this, uh, uh, of this gentleman is that he uh, builds houses, he just doesn't build houses, he buys blocks of land or backyards and he buys an old weatherboard, cuts it in half, has it trucked and, and craned into the backyard and then he develops it. So you'd have this beautiful character home. And, um, and anyway, one day he woke up on a Saturday morning and it dawned on him, today's the day the house is arriving. Now, what you have to do when a, house, when a house arrives is that you've actually got to pay for the power company to come and move the power lines for the hour so that the crane can get in, lift up this house and put it in the back, in the backyard, right? And he woke up this morning, he went, oh, the house is arriving, the trucks are going to be here in a couple of hours and I haven't rung the power company. And what's more, not only hadn't he rung the power company, but he hadn't okayed it with the next door neighbour to move a, wait for it, double brick fence so that some access can be getting gotten into the backyard, right? Can you imagine that right now there are thousands and thousands of dollars on the line, like tens of thousands of dollars, like the permits for all of that is just extraordinary, right? And so he woke up this morning and went, oh, no. I'm sure that's not what he said. <laughs> but he has such extraordinary faith that what actually happened was in the middle of the night, unbeknownst to him, a freak wind and mini storm <laughs> flew in. <laughs> and so he noticed something that when he went to go turn on the lights, the electricity wasn't working. He said, oh, well, it's, uh, maybe I did have it turned off. Maybe, I've, maybe I'm better than what I think I am. And he goes to the front neighbour and, and, uh, and the front neighbour says, nah, mate, nah, mate, the line's been down since about 2 a.m. this morning. A branch came and wiped out the whole power lines. <laughs> and he went... Whew. let's go talk about the brick fence. Well, he goes down the side of the place and the brick fence is on its... <laughs> and he goes, who, what, how? And he, just, and he just knows. He faithfully gives, he faithfully serves God. He's just got that gift of where he doesn't speak negativity into situations. He just, he, it's just an extraordinary gift upon this man's life. And God made it all happen perfectly. The house arrived, he sat back, watched it, built it, made money, awesome. So, yeah, amazing, right? So, so today, as I've said to you, um, today there's, there's people here today 
that your life is surrounded by things that, that potentially make you uncomfortable and, and, and they're very real challenges. And what I'm asking you to do is that maybe, and, and just maybe, it could be tied up with the language that you use and your attitude towards the situations. And you see, sometimes God uses those situations just to shape something in us and around us, all right? And, it, and it's God's not the cause of it. Sometimes, a lot of the time, we are the cause of it. But the truth is this, I'm asking for us today to make an intentional shift that whenever you hear something of what God has done in another person's life, that you take time to celebrate it somehow, Take time to celebrate it. Hey, that's awesome. Let's go out for coffee. Seriously. Hey, that's awesome. Let's sing happy birthday or something. You know what I mean? Let's celebrate. Whatever flicks your switch in celebrating, do that. Because it's worth it. You see, in the Bible, they, what they would do when God did something, they'd build a big rock monument. So that forever and a day, everyone who walks past it, what's that mound of rocks for, Dad? Well, that's when... The whole nation crossed the Red Sea. You see what I mean? And you see, in our Western culture, we're actually not that good at building memorials to God, remembering and recalling what He has done in our life. Can we say an amen? amen. At first, it may seem a bit mechanical and a bit clunky. Does that make sense? It's a bit like if I was to write now, say, Jesus is King. Yeah, see, it felt a bit clunky, didn't it? You know what I mean? You know, but if I say, guess what? Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Yeah. That was still really clunky, and I'll try to... Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Yeah. All right. Your spirit should resonate with that and say, yes, absolutely. He is. He is. He's my King. Right. But eventually what will happen is you'll develop a habit. You'll develop a great attitude and your language will shift as a result of it. So you are made in the image of God. What we need to understand is at the moment, the English language is changing quite rapidly. The English language you may or may not have known, and I'm just letting you know I know nothing about what I'm about to talk about. English language was previously recognised as Anglo-Frisian and before that West Germanic, 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 and Germanic, I don't know what it could be, and all European language was known as Proto-Germanic. According to the father in my big fat Greek wedding, everything came from the Greeks, <laughs> even Windex, of course. But today we've seen significant shifts even in our own language. You see, the English language and our language, you might get uncomfortable with saying, oh, people are trying to change the way we talk and what things that we're allowed to say and we're not allowed to say and it's political this and it's political that and all the political correctness thing. But what we have to understand is that since language has been a thing with humans, <laughs> it's been changing regularly. Anybody remember the word rad? Brad rad or rad brad, I don't know. You see what it, rad, I mean, it was, it was short for radical, radical? like, you're yeah, right. <laughs> radical, man. I, I know somebody in this room is trying to bring rad back <laughs> and it's not going so well. Do you remember, do you remember sweet, like sweet? Let's go down to Macca's, sweet, I'll see you there. You know what I mean? All right? I'm going to read you an article which, um, <coughs> again, <coughs> proves that I know nothing about what I'm talking about. Is It's by Kevin Donnelly. Um, in, this is taken out of the Herald Sun. And Dr. Kevin Donnelly is a senior research fellow at the Australian Catholic University and the author of Politically Correct Dictionary and Guide. <laughs> you ready? This is going to be interesting. All right. So... Get this, I'm not going to read all of it, don't worry. <laughs> I've just highlighted a couple of areas. But um, in 2009, I'm going to quote, the 2019 word of the year, according to Merriam-Webster's Col Collegiate Dictionary, is they, 
is they. That's their word for the year, 2019. I know, it's remarkable stuff. Anyway, and for those old enough to remember when schools taught grammar and parents corrected their children's misuse of language, the modern they is no longer defined as a plural pronoun. As mandated by radical gender and sexuality activists, the politically correct they refers to lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex and non-binary binary individuals who no longer want to be described as he or she. Such is the dominance of the PC, politically correct brigade's def definition of they, that Victorian public servants now undergo re-education programs in which they are told referring to people as she or he makes them guilty of heterosexuality. Isn't this nonsense? Um, the American Global Language Monitor, didn't even know there was one, listed woke, <laughs> woke as its 2019 word of the year. While most people associate woke with not being asleep, the po political co correct brigade definition refers to people who embrace cultural left language and group think. Yeah. <laughs> to be woke is to be radicalised on issues involving gender and sexuality, marriage, the environment, global warming and the significance of Western civilization. and, wait for it, judo-christianity the prevalence of pc language you can read this later i'm not reading all of it it's a very interesting article the prevalence of pc language is so widespread that universities now have diversity toolkits and inclusive inclusivity guidelines in which academics and students are told they should describe the arrival of the first fleet as an invasion and that it is wrong to describe pre-european aboriginal culture as primitive some of this has some merit, correct? But I haven't got to the best bit yet. <laughs> it goes on to say women and men are happy with, that are happy with their birth sex are now described as cis women and cis men and are guilty of, guilty of cis normativity. <laughs> the Monash University's inclusive teaching cook the <laughs> Inclusive Teaching Toolkit describes this as assuming everyone is cisgender and that all people will continue to identify with the gender they were assigned at birth. And it's no wonder those who are woke, who are woke, prefer almond or soy milk with their free trade organic free coffee. <laughs> According to the People for Ethical Treatment of Animals, dairy milk has long been a symbol of white supremacy. And to make matters even more difficult, politically correct activists argue that even if you don't intend to offend, you can be guilty of unconscious bias defined by the Australian Public Service Commission as unintentionally causing offence by stereo stereotyping marginalised individuals and groups, defending the status quo and exhibiting confirmation bias. English language is changing, friends. It's changing in our community. It is changing. And I'm not saying Eng English language is changing necessarily for the better. But what I'm saying is that there is a shift in our culture of things that we can, that, that supposedly, supposedly, I'm not saying you can or you can't talk about it, but what I'm saying is there are issues. Okay, let me, let me go, go this far. Uh, a democratic government or a free, a free people is based on the ability to have a constructive conversation about almost anything, to be able to have a conversation about it. But at the moment in our society, you can't even talk about some of these things without being condemned as something other than what your heart really is. Hello? Hello? And you see, this is, this, the reason why I'm talking about this is that we as a church and we as people of God can far too easily be influenced and boxed simply because uh, uh, we, we're not aware of the language being changed or at the very least, we are beaten into submission so that we don't talk about the good things of God and how God loves us and how God has made us male and female and how God has healed us. 
You see, friends, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, it said they overcame him, being the devil, by the word, by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. You see, friends, the spirit of this world at the moment would want us to be silent on so many of these issues that the church historically has not handled well, mind you, but at the same time, just because the church historically hasn't handled well, doesn't mean we don't have a voice today. Hello? And so here, language is being changed significantly. And language, you know, you know language change was God's idea? Yes. See, back in the Tower of Babel, <laughs> man was building this awesome temple and, and like man was getting too big, big for his boots and so God just said, I'm going to divide you by languages and suddenly nations were formed. Yes. So language change is actually okay. Yes. I hope that my language is getting better the more that I learn. Well, it's getting better -er sometimes. <laughs> so, our environment is changing. Th how the world operates is changing. That means we must be also changing. And change for us is all about growing in God. And the only way that we can grow in God is because this. God's word will always remain. See, he says everything will pass away, but there's one thing that will remain. It's his word. Yeah. You see, there is power in the spoken word. So in God's word, there's a book in the Bible called Deuteronomy. And Deuteronomy can often be a very boring book to read because it's all laws, what you should do when this happens and if you touch that, then you need to kill that and you need to do this and then you need to do that, right? It's, it's, a, it's a, a, lot, a lot of book of laws and, and um, it, you know, Josh at the moment is going through Leviticus and it's just like, <laughs> you know, and uh, he's loving it. He's just so excited to read his Bible every night. But the truth is, no, he's not, that's right. But the truth is, he's excited when I read it to him because he just gets to snore, but that's all right. But the truth is this, is that, is that in that book of Deuteronomy, there are commandments and statutes. So you need to understand the difference between a commandment, uh, uh, the, definition, the definition of a commandment is essentially, you must do this in order to achieve that, or you must not do this in order to achieve that. Whereas a statute, according to the, to the book of Deuteronomy, and that I understand that the definition might be different for us, pardon me, as a Western culture. But a statute in the Hebrew culture back then, a statute was a principle. So a principle, how many know that the, the, the law of gravity is an absolute law? Yeah. Right? But there is a principle in the Bible that Jesus said, with God, all things are possible. So within the statute, probably a poor example, but within a statute, a statute is a principle that actually reveals God's heart towards the matter. So if I've accidentally fallen off a really tall cliff, I'm going to be praying and saying, Lord, even though there is a law of gravity that you have put in place, thankfully, since the beginning of time, um, uh, since the beginning of time, right now, there is a statute that as I'm falling through the air, I'm really enjoying this flying feeling, but it's the sudden stop at the bottom that's really going to be my end, right? So I'm going to call upon your statute that said, that said that you will take care of me everywhere I go, right? That's a statute, all right? And so Deuteronomy really starts to uh, uh, unpack commandments and statutes. Why are we talking about this? The truth of commandments and statutes is the power of the spoken word. Because in the power of the spoken word, what we see is this. The power of language. In Luke chapter 6, verse 45, a good man, it says this, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure, evil 
uh, treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, you may know it, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if this is true, in Deuteronomy, a, 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 the, is, the normal Israelite um, would have, if there was a book that they had to know, it had to be Deuteronomy. Genesis was good, all the others were good in the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, but, it, but Deuteronomy was the thing that they absolutely had to know because it contained the commandments and the, the intentions and the statutes of God, which reveals this. <clears throat> We've covered that power of language, <clears throat> which reveals this. Lashon Hera. This is a principle that was spoken about in Deuteronomy and I think has some incredible relevance to us today. You see, Lashon Hera means evil speech. And it's not just negative speech. I can speak negatively about a situation. Aren't these fires awful? Isn't what has happened as a result of these fires really, really bad? I'm talking to the negative. We're not going to say, these fires, God will turn everything for good. We know that there is a statute and a principle that says God will turn all things for good. But we know the reality of fires that have ravaged people's homes is not good. Okay, but <clears throat> I want to tell you a story that will illustrate Lashon Hara. Hannah Smith was a 14-year-old schoolgirl li living in Lutterworth, Leicestershire, bright and outgoing. She enjoyed an active social life and seemed to have an exciting future ahead of her. On the morning of August the 2nd, 2013, Hannah, Hannah was found dead in her bedroom. She had taken her own life. Seeking to unravel what had happened, her family soon discovered that she had been the target of anonymous and abusive posts on a social network web website. Hannah was a victim of the latest variant of the oldest story in human history, the use of words as weapons by those seeking to inflict pain. The new version is called cyberbullying. Bullying. Hannah was found dead in her bedroom because of this. The Jewish phrase for this kind of behaviour is Lashon Hara, evil speech, speech about people that is negative and derogatory. It means quite simply speaking badly about people and is a subset of the biblical prohibition against spreading gossip. You see, Deuteronomy talks about Lashon Hara. And it, this was something that was displayed in the Jewish and the Hebrew culture that a statute was, was developed and it was called this word. Despite the fact that it's not singled out in the Torah for a prohibition in its own right, the sages regarded it as one of the worst of all sins. They said astonishingly that it is as bad as the three cardinal sins. They saw Lashon Hara as bad as idolatry, murder and incest combined. It is significant. And yet in our Western culture, we have free speech. We can say anything about anyone. More significantly, in the context of Hannah Smith, they said it kills three people. This is, this is taken from the Torah. It kills the one who says it, the one that they say it about, and the one who listens. It's extraordinary. And it is a problem in churches today, more so. It's so significant that there are examples of the Bible in the Bible, that where leprosy was as a result of people speaking badly about others. They concluded that it was precisely because it was a punishment 
for Lushan Hara, or in other words, derogatory speech. There's the story of Miriam, who spoke uh, slightingly about her husband, Moses, because of the Ethiopian wife he had taken. In Numbers chapter 12, verse 1, we haven't got time to go there today, but in Numbers chapter 12, verse 1, you can read about how Miriam, she, God cursed her with leprosy. Now, praise God, that's, praise God that he's, he, we live in a New Testament covenant today, amen? Yeah. Otherwise, we'd all be leprous. <laughs> Hello? Like, I need to bring some reality here, yeah? Okay? And, and, God, and Moses pleaded with God, don't let that happen to my wife, please. And the leprosy left after 11 days. God healed her from that. But she was never made whole again, so she was always scarred from that leprosy. Clearly, this is no minor matter because Moses singles it out among the teachings he gives the next generation. Remember what the Lord your God did to Miriam along the way after you came out of Egypt in Deuteronomy 24.9. Moses actually said that it was a significant thing. It's, there's, and there's, oddly enough, derogatory speech is not just about somebody, it is also about yourself. And this is why I started off by pointing out the fact that you are made in God's image. We often, yeah, I'm an idiot, or, oh, silly me, or it, derogatory speech is, oh, I'm getting old, I'm forgetting things. You know, well, yeah, that's, I, I understand that there's the nat- natural thing of that. You know, uh, my brother took us out on the, uh, on the boat, took us out as a family, out on the boat Friday, and my body was made to do things that I'm sure it just wasn't made to do. <laughs> I bent in ways that it hasn't been bent in in a long way, in a long time. And so you get a little bit sore and you go, oh, I must be getting old. No, no, no. No, if you speak those sorts of things, that's personal derogatory speech when you speak those sorts of things over your own life. Or oh, I can't do this, or I can't do that. Well, there may be areas that you're gifted in, there may be areas that you're not gifted in, but if you continue to talk yourself down, then you will become a very small person. And I'm not talking in the stature of height. It even happened to no- Moses, Moses, It even happened to Moses when he doubted God's word. You see, God said to Moses, go and free my people. And he said, but I'm not of eloquent speech. And so what the the sages have brought, the Jewish sages have brought truth about God's statutes is that when when God was proving that his power, when, when Moses put his hand into his cloak and then came out leprous, God's anger burned against Moses because he was doubting himself. Friends, we need to work on this as people of self-doubt and self-putting down. Moses doubted Israel. But Lord, they're not going to believe me. But God's response is, they don't have to believe you. They have to believe in me. And then he went on to say, they have to believe in themselves. We can read about the evil report that the Israelites came back with and the spies when they went into the, when, when they went into the land. <laughs> Jesus. When they went into the land. When they, just to wake you up, is that all right? Like, we've, in, we've employed buzzers in the chairs. Just, no. um, just, just you know... When the spies, the spies came back with a Lashon Hara. That's what they came back on. And it cost the entire nation, a whole generation, 40 years, because of derogatory speech. They spoke against the word of God because God had already said, here is the promised land that I'm going to take you in. I would be very annoyed with you if you limited my life to that. You should be annoyed with me. You see, so that brings in an accountability for us to say, hey, let's let's absolutely, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony, by the words that we speak, by the things that we say, by the evil speech that we have. You 
It's interesting, back in uh, Genesis, it said, then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Uh, the the, the, the uh, Hebrew, the original Hebrew words actually renders that last phrase, and the man became a living being, th- that it says this, quote, and the man became a speaking being. Why would it highlight the difference between a man who was breathing and a man who was speaking? Why? Because in Genesis, God said, let let us make man in our image with the same power of speaking words and life. Deuteronomy says, I place before you death, I place before you life. Choose life. And we choose life by speaking, not speaking evil speech. And I'm not talking about that we can't have, you know, a little bit of fun. But what I'm talking about, and I'm not talking about that we have to be word Nazis for each other. Wait, you can't say that, Chloe. Lashon Hara, you know what Pastor Matt said on Sunday? No, what I'm saying is evil speech and derogatory speech about somebody or about something or about yourself. Friends, it's the testimony. It's the words that we speak, the words of life or the words of death. Lashon Hatov is what we want. It's good speech, speaking words of life, speaking God's word that remains true. Our belief here at Manningham Christian Centre is testimonies are worth celebrating. Yes, that's right. How you respond is vital to seeing your own testimony and how you see yourself. Anna and I have got a few things that we're believing for as a family and as a, as a couple personally. And, you know, over the years, we've seen our friends miraculously have those things provided. And, you know, it'd be easy for me to go, <laughs> God, why did they, <laughs> you know, you know that they're a sinner as well, you know. <laughs> you know. <laughs> when really is, it's our response. It's our response. So I'm exercising the muscle of, yes, you've had that car bought for you. That's extraordinary. But I can actually celebrate that because in my lifetime, I too have had three cars bought for me. Praise God. That is a testimony of God's provision. Because if they hadn't, I'd be much fitter. (laughs) So how testimonies are absolutely worth uh, celebrating. Amen? We've got to retell it because when we retell it, we relive it. That testimony of how God healed your shoulder, healed your back, healed you, provided for you. I've got a testimony about my BMX hot foot too. For about, I, re- I reckon it was about two and a half years that every night as a little kid, I'd just pray and pray, God help me, you know, I, I just, I want that BMX, I want a bike and, you know, I want to be able to ride it and, you know, that's, oh, I'd say, <clears throat> and then one day, one day somebody walked up to, uh, I'm not sure whether it was mum or dad, in the supermarket and said, here, I believe your son has been asking for a BMX, go buy it. And the guy just walked away, didn't know who it was. <laughs> Have you got wings? Or, you know what I mean? Like, full on, right? Guess what? I'm believing for a few more things other than a BMX, but I praise God for the BMX. Yeah. I still have it. <laughs> of course I do. <clears throat> So in the original word for testimony, in the original word for testimony, there is the word ud. It's U-D, but it's pronounced ud. Everybody say ud. Ud. That ud in the original Hebrew means do it again. Do it again. Do it again. Do it again. So when somebody gets healed out out of a wheelchair, do it again. When somebody gets healed of cancer, do it again. When somebody gets a little toothache or a little graze healed, do it again. When somebody gets $2 because they need it, do it again, God. Absolutely. Praise God. Amen? <clears throat> so this is an intentional shift for us as a church. In order to partner with God and see His kingdom come, we must display outward, outwardly. We must display outwardly 
we must display outwardly because of this, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. <coughs> I know that outward appearance is not always an inward sign. I can really dance awesomely on the inside. <laughs> but if you want to see me dance on the outside, you'll just go, what is that? <laughs> right? But if you look like you've been sucking on lemons, the chances are you probably have. Yes. It's a really good word, God. No. We need to be big people, open up, cause this intentional shift within our own life and say, I'm going to celebrate outwardly. Hello? Hello? We must shout, wave our hands, get over ourselves and get excited about what God is doing. Because the Bible says it this way. It actually says it, it, actually says it this way. Unbelievers will, be, will believe by what they see in your life. And if you're excited about life, if the world is more excited about life than the church, then we have a problem. <laughs> we are super excited about life because there are more good things happening in the world than there ever has been in the history of mankind. Yes. The world is actually getting better. <laughs> the media does not want you to believe that, but the world is actually getting better. It is. I know my world's getting better. Is your world getting better? Come on. <laughs> That might be a faith statement. So what are we going to do? Step one, speak out, retell, relive, speak good speech. Lashon Hera, I've got more stuff that I can share with you about all this, but not today. Lashon Hera, that's the step one. Allow yourself a buddy that you can walk with and say, hey, if I speak Lashon Hera, then can you tell me? Can you just tell me? And even if you're over the top about telling me, I give you permission to do that and somewhere we're going to find the balance in the middle. Yeah, Is that cool? That you can walk with somebody in that, all right? You know, I'm speaking positive things over the Richmond Football Club for 2020. <laughs> it's going to be a good year. Step two, celebrate openly God's provision, healing and miracles. Just by me standing here, in fact, I didn't intentionally use that picture, but the picture of seeing Noah, of where uh, the furlong generations shared on Father's Day last year in September. I just look at that and that there is a testimony of God's goodness and provision in Andy and Rebecca Furlong's life that goes right through into Anne and Peter and, and the rest of our Beck's family. It's just an extraordinary thing to be able to see that picture and go, you know what? That's what that represents. That represents the goodness of God and the provision of God in that. Yeah. Step three, find someone to walk the journey with you, friends, because we're not made to do it on our own. We're not made to be islands. We are made to be walking with somebody in that. And if you haven't got somebody, then I, I can't say I, I can be that person for each and every single one of you. But man, I'd love to help you find that person. Find that person that you're going to be able to walk that journey with. Is that cool? So we're going to intentionally make this shift. It'll be clunky a few times, the first few times. You know, when somebody gets up here and says, you know, I stubbed my toe and now it's all better. Yeah. And you're going to go, um. <laughs> or is it going to be, I stubbed my toe, I stubbed my toe and now it's all better. Yeah. That's right. At first, it'll be a bit put on and I know you're just doing it just because we're talking about it right now. But see, next Sunday, when you can only remember about 0.8% of what we talked about today, and somebody gets up and says, guess what? God healed my throat. You're going to go. <laughs> Fantastic. Now God needs to heal your throat because you've just used that. No. And you see, what happens is, at first, there's going to be this intentional thing. So people up here are instructed to wait 
for the cheer and the celebration. If you hear of God's provision in someone's life, ring them up and say, hey, let's go out for coffee and celebrate. Let's celebrate what God has done. You know, I hear story after story of people who are sitting in cafes and they just start talking about the good things of God and then the the presence of God falls in the cafe. That lady that you saw was healed because of somebody as she was in the cafe, prayed for her in a cafe. Isn't that amazing? When you say, well, I can't do that. No, you may not, but you can talk about the good things of God in the cafe. No one's passed the law about that, as far as I know. Are we good? So let's make this intentional shift. I understand that there'll be moments of where we just, you know, we might be waiting for that celebration. And if I don't celebrate enough, hey, I give you permission to say to me, hey, you're not celebrating enough. And I'll go, doggone, you're right. Let's do it. Let's celebrate. Amen? Amen. Yeah, some of you going, "Mm, okay. We're going to do it. I'm looking forward to it. Let's stand. We're going to close in prayer. Has anybody had pain this morning and don't, doesn't have it anymore? Yeah? All gone. Yeah! That's real. I love it. Fantastic. I, I, got, I got like whiplash, man, like from being too adventurous on the back of the boat. And, uh, and, and it is 80% much better than what it was this morning. So, yes! I'm going to dance. Yeah. Thanks, Shyla. Shyla's saying, please dance on the inside, Dad. Is that derogatory speech? I'm being, no, no, no. Anybody else get healed of anything this morning? That's cool. I reckon God's healing our hearts and moving, him, moving us more into the likeness of his image today. And I believe that that's, that is what has happened by the release of today's word. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Let's pray. Thank you, Father. Lord, I just thank you right now for your goodness. I thank you, Lord, for your provision. I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our hearts, God. And so, Lord, I just ask that this word would soak deep within to our spirits, uh, deep into our spirits, and deep within us, God, that you would, you would shape us, mould us, and uh, prepare us for this year ahead. Lord, right now, we declare that 2020 is a wonderful year. Lord, we declare that 2020 is a year of great transformation, great formation, and Lord, great growth in each and every single person's life, Lord. Lord, we lift up unsaved family members that don't yet know you. And Lord, we call them into the kingdom right now in Jesus' name. Father, that we declare this year, this year, Lord, you have given us authority in the way that we speak. And so right now, each and every single person here that has unsaved friends and family, right now, we call them into your kingdom and we declare that this year would be the year that they would come into right relationship with you in Jesus' mighty and wonderful name. And we all said, Amen, amen and amen. If you